Welcome to a special edition of Ballpark Magazine, the Super Duper Baseball Blooper Issue. My neighbor said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm headed to Kansas City to see the Orioles play. And he said, what? Have you lost your head? <laughs> guys that spent time together in the minor leagues. Yeah, there are quite a few of us. But... Oh. That probably means that Rona might be going to the minor leagues. And if so, the question is, can Rona bear it? <laughs> oh, my God. Time is called. Now the, the home plate umpire sees it. He's pointing what? at it. Greg's Eric, looking out the left field. Eric's looking down the left field. He thinks there's something <laughs> on the field. Now he sees it. Oh. <laughs> Take a bite. <laughs> Before we turn to the heart of this issue, let's first hear from our faithful readers. Madeline Malinowski of New York City writes, Dear Ballpark Magazine, I constantly hear announcers refer to a utility player. What exactly is a utility player? Well, Madeline, this is someone like Jose Ukendo, who's so versatile, the manager can put him anywhere he pleases. Jose Ukendo, the secret weapon. Going for the Redbird. In the right field, Okendo. One gone. Okendo throws him out. What a play by Okendo. Yes, Madeline. Jose, can you see, is everywhere. And the pitch is lined in the left field. Here comes Okendo, and he's got it. The jack of all trades, Jose Okendo. Jim Rogal of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania writes, Dear Ballpark, I finally accepted the concept of the designated hitter in the American League. Now, I'm hearing rumors about a designated fielder. Are they true? Well, Jimbo, you've caught us off guard on this one, but you never know what's going to pop up. Finally, Jackie Freed of Atlanta, Georgia writes, Dear Ballpark, I recently attended my first baseball game and I was very confused. How many outs are there in an inning? Well, Jackie, you must have attended the game between the Phillies and the Atlanta Braves. Andres Thomas on to Perry for out number two. That'll bring up Vaughn Hayes. A correction, out number three. Wait a minute. <laughs> there are only two outs, folks. <laughs> Hold everything here. Hold everything. <laughs> oh, I okay. thought I was losing it there for a minute. I don't know how in the world that happened. <laughs> How can nine players out in the field all be confused about how many outs there are? I have never seen that happen in all the years that I've watched baseball. Oh, but to answer your question, Jackie, in one inning, there are six outs. strike zone where pitchers and batters wage their daily war 
The strike zone is often a source of frustration and bewilderment. It offers no quarrel on a swing and a miss, but do it enough and you can lose your grip. Want to see a sailing bat? Here it is. I've always wanted to see a sailing bat. Sometimes the ball never makes it to the strike zone. On these occasions, revenge is often in order. This doesn't bother pitchers, as they tend to turn the other cheek. Besides, they're too busy cultivating the delicate relationship between pitcher and umpire. An unhappy pitcher can leave an umpire helpless. But as every umpire knows, this game can be played by two. Let's see, did it hit him? Yes, right there. And luckily, Harvey throws about 10 miles an hour. Foul balls are strikes, and sometimes outs. And one pitch allows no argument right down the middle and that's the frustration of a pretty good hitter that's batting well under 200. But with all these balls and strikes it can sometimes get confusing. Bob Engel thinks it's strike three. Robert you're thinking about that favorite restaurant the count is three and two or is it? Uh, Houston players are leaving the field the count should be three and two. Bob Engel embarrassed this time. He's trying to keep from laughing and smiling. Embarrassing moments can take place any time you cross the strike zone. Real embarrassing. And just when you thought you'd avoided the issue completely, another strike is behind you. now if you dare inside your worst baseball nightmare a place where evil lurks and schemes a place that's called the field of bad dreams where balls can find the smallest crack and home runs torment you by bouncing back for only on the field of bad dreams do bumps roll forever or so it seems and when at last the ball stays fair, the fielders seem to forget it's there. Here catcher Sal Butera pitches, baffling hitters with his hitches, and leaving most of them in stitches. A field that on a pitch by Kipper, the runner breaks, unbeknownst to the pitcher, who catches one for the Gipper. Where calling time calls for a double take And yes, the double he will take It's only here a routine grounder Seals a shoddy infield's fate For while at third they flop and flounder The awful runner takes home plate <laughs> so come with us to the field of bad dreams Where nothing is the way it seems Where even doubles test the brain When ground rules don't include the drain For in this land of nightmare lore The bad dreams leave you wanting more of things You've never seen before well, there's another ball. It scoots over near the Phillies dugout, and this ball is going to try to, it stays on the lip, and Schmidt's going to try to come home. Nobody's covering. Oh, my goodness. I have never in my life seen that. We just had a power failure here at the stadium. Well, we
we've seen it all now. <laughs> Somebody pulled the plug on this thing. Well, the lights are out in Georgia. And, and we've got a flood. Field, the center field, we've got a geyser. Or as they said in the movie Bull Durham, we got ourselves a natural disaster. Strike three was called, and Gladden was out of the box. Gladden stepped out. McClellan apparently told him to get back in, motion for Hudson to throw the pitch, and he was called out. What a bizarre out. Two balls and a strike. What, that ball hit Tommy? Holy cow, he wasn't looking. Barrett is running, swing and a miss, the throw to second by Kennedy, and the runner is safe. What a bit of trickery on the part of second base. Obviously the throw was there in time. Marty knew that. He pulled up short purposely. Sure did, didn't he? That's incredible. Carter unable to tag in advance and wisely remaining at second. With the Mets down by four and there are two out here in the ninth inning. Now Carter's called out and the ball game is over. You think it's safe up in the press box? It's not supposed to shatter like that. That's plexiglass wow. up there. Runners are going. Brooks lost the bat. The throw down to third. And Bonilla seemed to be clipped by the bat. Watch this. The bat, the ball, and Garcia arrive at third base at the same time. That's weird. Here's the bat. Garcia avoids it. Bonilla can't. The ball hit it. This is the first time I've ever seen this. This slider's hit deep to left field. Daniels back on the track at the wall. He jumps. Run again. Home run. Oh no! My, oh my goodness! I'm starting to sound like Phil Rizzuto. Hit deep to center. Robin back. Does he have it? I think he made a great catch. He did. Unbelievable. Oh. Was beautiful. The Brewers win. It's a dinger. He lost the ball over the fence. It fell out of his glove? Yes. The second base umpire signaled out. And everyone in the stadium, ball players included, fooled on that one. And that's precisely what we mean in this the field of bad, bad dreams. When you talk about baseball players' most embarrassing moments, everyone is the master of rationalization. That wasn't goofy. That was supernatural. Um, I, I, I think it was the Aurora Borealis went off that night. They'll only be able to get one if they can get that here. John bobbles the ball and to the helmet. John does not normally make that kind of mistake. They're going to try to score a kick there. And Tommy. Tommy made two errors. Tommy should have stayed right on the mound. <laughs> well, you're right, absolutely. Three errors? They can't give him three errors, no. At one time, it was time for me to go up to, to hit, and I just had to go to the bathroom. I just had to go. And uh, they just had to wait until I was done. And then, of course, there was the time Lloyd Mosby stole second base, and first base, and second base again all on the same play. There goes Mosby, picked a good pitch to go on, terrible throw. Mosby doesn't know where the throw is, he's going back to first base. <laughs> is he going to steal first? He steals Look first. Now he's going to steal second again. I've never seen it before. <laughs> this is something that I just wanted to make a video for the kids for on how to do things twice uh, and, and be successful at doing so. That is probably the most unfortunate thing out of the whole year. I didn't even get a stolen base for it. Mm, I started against the Cubs uh, one Sunday afternoon. I think I faced eight hitters, and I only got one out, and he almost killed the third baseman. I tried to throw the ball in my glove. I missed the glove. Howard made a great save between third and short. It was a one-run game. Uh, if he doesn't come up with the save, you know, it's a tie game. And uh, I, I got a save. Howard got a save. We got two saves in that game. show on turf. 
the three ring four base spectacular that stands head and shoulders above the rest. Let the ballpark big top begin. And so without further ado, let's send out the clowns and get underway. I said send out the clowns and let's get underway. Will somebody get that clown off the field? <laughs> Thank you. And now, keep your eye on the ball as baseball's jugglers take center stage. where, with so much going on, you don't know which way to look. In this ring, we have the amazing and somewhat ridiculous-looking half-bearded man. Most people stopped doing this when they were 12 years old. The tall man, the short man, are we on a roll now or what? And just when you thought the trapeze artist had gone home, we present the amazing freestanding leap over the dome. And now, back to the sideshow with wild animal trainer, Gunga Gunga Jones. Do not be afraid of the wild animals. They will not hurt you. I said do not be afraid. Just keep your eyes on them at all times. The wild animals are really quite harmless. Watch how I carefully control this king of the astroturf with no fear whatsoever. And now for our finale, the Tumblr. This one fact we're crystal clear. The baseball booth is not to fear. But when the games start running long, announcers sing a different song. <laughs> yeah, the great suspenders out tonight. There is a place on the earth where the sun sets in the east. Okay. Appears to set oh. in the east. <laughs> okay. It's true. How are our government relations with Spain? Do you happen to know? They're fine, as far as I know. In the Panama Canal, as you go through the Panama Canal, it leads back and forth, and the sun appears to come up in the west and set in the east. Give me an Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's <laughs> Lindsay Nelson here, CBS Radio Sports. Paul Horning is on the squeegee. He's at the 30-yard line to the 20. It's such a pleasure to be broadcasting this rain delay from Toronto's Exhibition Stadium. What about Roger Rabbit? You want to talk about that for a I haven't seen that one. And if you don't like Pee Wee Herman, you need to be checked. Well, what else can we talk about? Have you ever heard of cow tipping? Cow tipping? Yeah. They're <laughs> pigeons. They're worthless creatures. <laughs> and the jellyfish. You ever swim with a jellyfish? Try not to. Oh, August. August is jellyfish month here in the East Coast. We're really running out of things to talk yeah, about, aren't we? Yeah, just covering everything here. Valley Regional High School was on the Housatonic River, on Is the banks right? of the Housatonic. In fact, I can sing the fight song, but that, no, I won't, I won't do that. How can the Bee Gees stay in alive, a much-disdained disco record, 
rank ahead of Mitch Ryder and Devil with a Blue Dress on. Sing it. High above the Housatonic, <laughs> mid the Berkshires, proud and true. And what have you and Mr. Blast been talking about tonight? Anything? Uh, nothing you... important. <laughs> no, no. If I tuned in today's game, it's the first game I ever saw. It, I would say, you know, I listened to two guys tell me about Parsley, Hitler. That's right. <laughs> and some baseball. And I think Curly of the Three Stooges would have summed up this series by saying, <laughs> And now, this one and only message from our sponsor. Is it important? Just look. New York Mets relief pitcher Roger McDowell is known as baseball's premier practical jokester. And now, he's proud to announce the opening of Roger McDowell's School of Practical Jokes. Fans, it gets mighty boring out here in the bullpen sometimes, so I have to look for ways to liven things up a bit. So now, I've decided to let you, the viewing audience, in on some of my favorite pranks. Enroll today, and I'll show you how to plant rubber in the gloves of opposing outfielders. You'll also learn how to secretly doctor your opponent's bat before he steps up to the plate. And here's a good one. I'll teach you how to throw your voice while yelling, I've got it, I've got it, when your team hits an easy fly pop. And of course, my all-time favorite, greasing the mound for the opposing pitcher. <laughs> what a laugh. Be sure to sign up today. Baseball streaks belong only to the best, like Joe DiMaggio, who hit in 56 straight games, Lou Gehrig, who played more than 2,000 in a row, and the latest entry in the successive Hall of Same, Oral Hirschheiser, who pitched 59 straight scoreless innings. Fly ball to right on a semi-check swing. Gonzalez, the record. Oral Hirschheiser, 59 consecutive innings scoreless. The all-time record. What's Drysdale thinking? <laughs> Don't give me that stuff where guys always give it that, uh, oh, yeah, records are made to be broken. I was rooting for the kid. <laughs> Fat chance. Whose name you want the record book, yours or someone else's? Ah, uh, but not all streaks strike a player's fancy, like Eric Davis, who struck out nine straight times in two days of Mike Scott and Nolan Ryan. Corey Snyder knows the feeling. Corey had struck out nine straight times against Roger Clemens. Then, a miracle. Corey's contact left him clamoring for more. At least a, a step in the right direction as he had contact and flat out to shallow right. There it is, the handshake. <laughs> the high five, the low five. I got a fly ball against Roger Clemens. Then there's the saga of pitcher Don Carmen, who was 0 for 46 in his career and figured when in doubt, he might as well bunt. Carmen made it to first, but the error made him 0 for 47. A reprise was in order. Here's the two strike pitch, a bunt that trickles foul, and he's a strikeout victim. At 0 for 48 now, the bunt simply wasn't working. So Carmen took a cut. The batter, Don Carmen, up there to bunt probably. Nope, he's going to swing. Base hit through the middle. Oh! <laughs> I don't believe it. Don Carmen with his first major league hit. That snaps at 0 for 48 for him. I do not believe it. They're going to stop the game and give him the ball. Len Sakata owns still another streak worthy of forgetting. Sakata couldn't have bought a hit against the White Sox, going 0 for 66 over the course of seven seasons. But all streaks, whether good or bad, must soon come to an end. In the box score, it was one small hit, but it was a giant leap for Len.
finally, there's Dwayne Kuyper. Less known for his power than his glove, Dwayne had gone to the plate more than 1,300 times without hitting a home run. Then, one night, to the amazement of all, Dwayne Kuyper rocked Steve Stone. The game started early, 12 minutes early, and Bob Lemon, the manager, didn't know that. So when I went out to the bullpen to warm up, I found that I had seven minutes to warm up and didn't have a curveball, which at that point in my career was my big pitch. And I'm sure that Steve Stone's story would be that he wasn't loose. Well, he was loose enough to strike out the first hitter of the game. He likes to tell the story. It was 450 feet deep into the right field seats. I think it just cleared the fence, but the point was it went over. Dwayne gave him the yay as he's running around. And realized that he had watched me. Obviously, he did if he knew that I raised my arm. Or maybe it was the 8 by 10s that I sent him of these still shots that I had. <laughs> Whatever. It's the Dwayne Kuypers of the world who will always keep the streaks of the Joe DiMaggio's intact. It's time for a very special feature as Ballpark Magazine conducts its own star search in this, the first annual Baseball Talent Show. Today's category, impersonators who've made a lasting impression. So now, let's get on with the show. Thank you, thank you very much. And have we got a show for you. First, what do you say we take a look at those who didn't make the finals? All right, Pilgrim. I'm here to invite you to come out to the kingdom. I can really dig that, man. <laughs> oh, Mammy, it's your little boy, Sammy, all the way from Alabama. Don't want no eggs and hammy, Mammy. Hi, right, this is Ed Sullivan, inviting all you fans in the greater Seattle area. Well, it blows me down. <laughs> it's interesting to note there are so many broadcasters, but the best broadcasters are those who always do themselves and not try to imitate any other broadcaster. All right, Siegfried, we've got you completely surrounded by the entire 4th Cavalry. Would you believe the 3rd Cavalry? How about three Boy Scouts on roller skates? This is Jimmy Stewart. No, Meritor manager, Daryl Johnson. Area. Tom hits well, feels well, but his Jimmy Stewart uh, needs a lot of work. And how's this for a blast from the past? The Pedro and Tommy Show. All right, we'll get back to those guys. But first, now trust me on this one. Remember Cincinnati relief pitcher Brad the Animal Leslie? Well, he even prompted an imitation from the normally subdued Nolan Ryan. <laughs> Nolan Ryan doing Brad Leslie? You gotta be kidding. But you gotta love it. What do you think, Pedro, Tommy? How good? You can do it now, be tough. I bet Tommy loves this. But what about Tommy John? Well, it looks like Don Mattingly has him down just about perfect. Now, unfortunately, once Price Waterhouse tallied up the votes, none of these contestants, not even Pedro and Tommy, made it to this, the final round. Our second runner-up is Rick Dempsey who somehow manages to do a Robin Yao and an old Tommy Lasorda at the same time, featuring a brief cameo by Sammy Stewart as Jim Palmer. Get it? A brief cameo. Oh, boy. Toward right, curling down toward the corner. They won't get it, and it might get out. It will. See you later. Yao hits an opposite field home run. And now, our first runner-up, a tie between John Morris and Dennis Lamp, with Lamp doing Gaylord Perry almost better than the original. Now watch closely. Here's Lamp doing Perry, and here's Perry doing Perry. Well, you make the call. Now, Morris explains how to do Willie McGee. You gotta look like you're in a lot of pain and you're having a miserable time out there and then get up there and make it look like your knees are killing you and, you, and it's the last place in the world that you want to be out on the baseball field. And then just go out and lay out four line drives. <laughs> That's Willie. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. But listen, nobody does a Dave Winfield better than Lamb.
but the most natural impression has to be Morris doing Kirk Gibson. All year long, they look to him to light the fire, and all year long, he answered the demand. Here's the big pitch. He's got to make it happen on this one. High fly ball into right field. She is gone! And now it's time for the winner of the first annual baseball talent show. Pitcher Mark Grant of the San Diego Padres and his study in the calling habits of umpires. I got a lot of time to kill in the bullpen. So I, I check out the umpires. John Kibler from San Diego, you might be familiar with him. He's just real basic. He gets, squares up behind the plane, he goes, strike. One. Strike. One. The big Eric Gregg, we got the big Eric guys Greg. going. For a right-hander, he gets like this, and he'll go. For a left-hander, he'll go. Like that. <laughs> Frank Foley, he's another one of my Frank favorites. Frank Foley. He's kind of like the Rocky of the umpires. He'll be behind the plate and he'll go. <laughs> and then for a strikeout, he'll go. <laughs> John McSherry, big John. John McSherry, a big man. He'll just, he'll just motion with his hand like that. <laughs> Dutch Renner, my Dutch favorite. Renner. One of the all-time favorites, he's from the old school. Very vocal. He'll get behind the plane and go, stay right. One. <laughs> How'd you tell me Dutch Renner ordered a steak in the oh, restaurant? In the restaurant, he orders steak rare. Of course. We know which bloopers win our admiration, but what about the players themselves? Which ones do they like best? My favorite blooper, I guess, was about 1979. Ron Reed, one of our relief pitchers on the Phillies, was um, having a real tough time. He's in a slump. And he finally came in, had a 1-2-3 inning, hadn't pitched in a while, and uh, he did cartwheels off the mound all the way to the dugout. He's six foot seven. Unbelievable. We were playing in Minnesota. And there was a bunt down the line, and Kevin Seitzer came over. It was staying on the line, and Kevin goes on the inside of the line and starts blowing the ball so it could continue to roll foul. And just to have the, the ability to think about doing something like that is it just comes, it blows you away. Terry Mohan, we were playing the Mets a couple years ago. A ball was hit to him, and it stuck in his glove in between his fingers. And uh, instead of just taking the ball out, he calmly took his glove off and threw it over to first base. He didn't panic, and it, that's, that was just so him. Right back to the mound. Good stab by Mulholland. Runs most of the, the throw. What? The ball stuck in his glove, and that's why he ran so far at first. He couldn't get it out. And then he attempted to lob it with his glove hand, and the glove went with it. And Brindley caught them both. <laughs> the most ridiculous play that I that I have ever seen. Uh, I wouldn't call it funny, but and I was not involved in it. We were not involved in the game, but one night in New York. Uh, Carlton Fisk tagging out two runners at home plate almost simultaneously. I can't remember who's hitting, but Ozzie Guillen's a shortstop, and, and the hitter ends up losing the bat when he's swinging, and the bat's rolling out towards Ozzie, and Ozzie goes over and fields the bat and picks it up like he's going to throw the guy out of first with it. <laughs> That's pretty inventive for a, hitter, for a fielder to think that quickly. I thought it was, it was funny. I remember I was broadcasting a game, doing some work for the Mets, and the, they were playing the Cubs in, in, uh, in Chicago, and one of the batters for the Mets hit a ball, and, uh, and the guy lost it, fell down. He couldn't find it and walked around and ran around all over the field. Couldn't find it. Ball was in his hat on the ground. We were playing the, the uh, Philadelphia Phillies, and uh, I forget the, the uh, pitcher who was on second. Uh, I think that the ball um, went behind uh, the plate, and he was going from second to third, and he tripped over the base and just landed on his face. It was just the funniest thing I've ever seen. I think it was the blooper of the year. I, I couldn't stop laughing. It was so funny. Every super duper baseball blooper leaves its victim in a stupor as Ballpark Magazine looks at the bounces that went over with a bang.
To, to left field, and it's another chance for Mitchell, and he makes a fair-handed catch. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> gotta be the play of the year. Hit back, look at that, look what I have. And Viola even had time to look into the dugout to say to his teammates, I got it. Oh, oh Newman on the tarp makes the catch. Oh. Look at that stop by Palmer, unbelievable. to all, but I knew you were coming, for I am the compelling Llewellyn, the magnanimous magician, the prescient personality, the bedeviling bard of a baseball, able to see into the future, as with this, my first trick. The Magnificent Seven are warming up in the bullpen and will be with you as soon as Leonard hits into a 6-4-3. Six. Yes, thank you, thank you. But for me, the compelling Llewellyn, the baseball is merely a tour in the mystical, magical world of illusion. And I allude to illusion for a very good reason. Just watch. But do not be afraid, for as compelling as I am, I am always in control. Just keep your eyes on the ball, and you too will be amazed. <laughs> That's it, my son. Keep your eyes on the ball. Never let it leave your sight. Hey, what's the matter? You flunk a little league or something? For only I, the compelling Llewellyn, can make a ball disappear. Or so it seems, then reappear. Then watch the victim disappear into the minor world. Yes, I am indeed compelling. I simply can't say that enough. As I can make balls disappear into walls. And gloves, if I so choose. It's in the gloves, stupid. Catcher's hoy. The compelling Llewellyn can be a magical monster, putting one catch in the bag. Or agonizing over the agony of the defeat. The defeat, defeat, look at defeat. You must tip your hat to the compelling Llewellyn, for perchance that you don't, you might lose it. Compelling, no? I can make balls disappear into gloves, you see. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. And so can I make entire gloves disappear. But the compelling Llewellyn's greatest trick is not making gloves, or balls, or bats disappear. No, my dear friends, it's making entire ball players vanish. Magically! Just watch what I do to Lee Mazzilli. And again! Through doors, piece of cake. But there is one little problem with all of this. For once the ball players are gone, I am compelled to stop. What? Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. He is gone. I have compelled him to leave. Hey, what's with the freezer frame? I'm not finished. You can't do this. Don't put me back in the stupid blooper duper thing.